everybody doing this morning? Outstanding. I'm still saying Happy New Year. We are new and alive in Christ each and every day, and today is no different. So Happy New Year. I think we can say that every day. It'll be okay. Well, let's all stand up, and we're going to celebrate Christ, and we're going to celebrate our King, our Lord, and we're going to celebrate our Father and God in heaven. So let's join together with our call to worship. Let us ascribe to God glory and strength. Let us worship the Lord in the Holy Spirit. Let the Lord sit enthroned forever. May the Lord bless us with peace. Excuse me. 
And welcome on this wonderful Sunday morning. It's a bit chilly out there, so I put on my short sleeves, which I usually do. Just like my kids, it'd be 20 degrees outside. They go, do you need a jacket to go to school? I go, no, I don't want to wear one. Because I didn't want to forget it at school, because I knew by the end of school they would be warm enough and they would leave it at school, then we would fuss at them for leaving their jacket at school. So, Okay, a few announcements. Our prayer focus is the nomads working in our community. We want to pray for them, that they stay healthy, that they make an impact, that they will become a witness to the people that they meet. So just pray for them this week and the work that they are doing. Our bell players are practices beginning on Wednesday. If you would like to play bells and just want to see how it's doing, you can come this spring and Marilyn will give you a spring to see how you like it. Uh, they meet on Wednesday night at 5.30 and you're meeting somewhere back here probably. I've got to set it back up. They usually meet back there behind the sound booth. So if you're interested in that, just show up and Marilyn will do something with you. Also, um, the offering envelopes have been sent out and some people have said, I didn't get mine. Well, we called the list and sometimes we left people off that shouldn't have been left off. We're just not perfect. We won't be perfect until we see Christ. But so we, we ask for grace. So if you are missing your offering envelopes, did not get them and would like to, there is a sign-up sheet in the back there where you can write your name down there and how you would like them, whether you pick them up or have them mailed or delivered. So if you can do that, just sign there, or you can call Shirley in the office, either way. And the last announcement, um, the United Methodist Church has what they call six special Sundays. And on those six Sundays, we take up an offering for six causes every year. This is in addition to the <clears throat> offerings we take for the children's home. And the first one of the years, <clears throat> excuse me, is the one that uh, for Human Relations Day, it's usually the Sunday before Martin Luther King. And I got just a short little video to kind of tell you what that's about. If that's something you feel that you would like to give to next Sunday, you can bring an offering to that and just mark it Human Relations Day. And with that, then normally we would stand up and sing, but we got a special event today. We got a baptism and joy. I think I saw you come in. If you want to come up here, if you want your son to come up and stand by you, he can come. He doesn't. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. I present Brenda Joy Denton for baptism. She goes by Joy. On behalf of the whole church, Joy, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? And do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord, in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nation, and races? 
And to you, the church, to you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include joy in your care? Good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround her with a community of love and forgiveness that she may grow in her trust of God and be found faithful in her service to others. We will pray for her that she may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. And that's one of the neat things about baptism is we just entered our covenant with one another to walk together in this new life. And that's one of the neat parts of this service. Will the Lord be with you? Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. And you all respond. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among the people. And Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and on her who receives it. To wash away her sin and clothe her in righteousness through out her life that she that dying and being raised with Christ she may share in his final victory all praise to you eternal father through your son Jesus Christ who with you and the holy spirit lives and reigns forever amen and if you want to come around here joy and kneel you can take this so it, and put it up on there so water doesn't drip all over you And Brenda Joy Denton, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may stand up. And as members of this congregation, will you faithfully, we ask you as, as a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministry by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And that's your response to? Members of the household of God, I commend joy to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. And at this we welcome joy. So y'all stand up and welcome her. <clears throat> and amen. Oh, I, and this is for you. And while we're standing, let us go ahead and continue singing. in the 
the song of your salvation and all your people sing along so remember your people remember your children remember your promise oh god your grace is enough your grace is enough your grace is enough
Father, you are relentless in the search of us. We ask that you just place that very drive in our own hearts to be relentless for you. We ask that you place a drive in our hearts to seek those out who don't know your name or claim that you don't exist. Because you are our everything, we need to express that to the whole world, that you are everything to us and that they need you as much as we need you. Father, we ask that you give us the words each and every day as we're out there in this world, this crazy, crazy world, to continue to lift you up in the eyes of evil, in the eyes of Satan, so that we can push him out of the way. Father, we are a country divided right now, which is crazy for us. For so many years, we've been a, a, a United States, united together. Even though we might have a few differences here and there, Lord, you've always found a way to knit us together. But Father, we, we've forgotten you. We've cast you out of so many different places, Lord. We need to bring you back in. We don't need a political party or a, a government to tell us how or when, Lord. We just need to do it. We need to be to be your people and to continue to bring your name into each and everything to pray on everything to come to our knees to be with you
You may be seated. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, as we come here this morning, we come here with grateful hearts, thankful for your love, thankful for your acceptance of who we are, thankful that you make us your sons and daughters, that we're family, that we're called together with a specific purpose to share your love with the world. We thank you that you love us and you give us purpose. We thank you that you forgive us. We thank you that you send us out into the world. Oh Lord, you are such a good God. Lord, as we come here this morning praising your name, we come remembering that there are those that are hurting this day. There are those close to us that need your strength, your peace, your love, your healing, your restoration. Lord, we lift up all of those that are in our hospital this day. We ask that you heal them and restore them, Lord. Lord, we lift up all of those on our prayer list. Knowing you are the one who can restore, you know their needs better than we. We just know they need you, Lord, so we lift them up to you. And even now, Lord, we lift up to you that one name, that one request that is silent in our heart that we name before you now. Gracious Heavenly Father, we lift up our nomads that are here sharing of themselves, their talents, their time, their love. Lord, as they go into our community here, Lord, let them be a witness to your love. Let them point to a greater power, a greater hope, as they help people, as they lift them up, often by their words and by the work they do. So Lord, bless their work so that your light might shine in our community. And gracious Heavenly Father, we lift up our nation to you. It's been a tough year this last year. There's so much anger, so much finger pointing. Sometimes all we want to do is just rail on social media about how bad the other side is. Instead of looking around and seeing the good that we have. A good that comes from you, Lord. And so, Lord, we do lift up our nation and ask that you bless us. We lift up our leaders, Lord, and ask that you guide them. Help them to make good, sound decisions, Lord because their decisions affect us all. Give them strength to be courageous for you, for your ways and your love. And Lord, lift up our church. Bless it. Send it. Fill it with your spirit so that we might be empowered to do the work that you have called us to do, that we might be empowered with a boldness to share your love, that not be afraid of the words that are spoken, the things that are said about us in our faith, that we have your boldness to go and to share your love in everything we do, the words we speak, the actions we give off. Lord, let us be completely sold out to you in everything we do. Fill us with that same passion that some football fans have, that some people have for their parties. Let us have that passion for you wherever we go. That nothing else in this world matters but you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we might live that Holy Spirit life. And Lord, we know all this is possible because of your Son, Jesus Christ 
who died on the cross for us and rose again to offer us eternal life, eternal hope, eternal peace. And so now we offer up the prayer that he taught us while on earth. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time, we invite our children <coughs> to head off to Children's Church. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. Um, not at this service. We'll... Oh, no. 
You may be seated. We now have to come to that time where we virtually receive our tithes and offerings. If you haven't placed them in the baskets in the back, you can do so now. And hopefully this week you received a letter from me about your pledges for this coming up year. And I hope you, you will take that in prayer with God and that you'll fill that out and really between you and God, we'll record it and only use it to let you know where you are, and see how God is blessing you this year. And I've always encouraged people to take that step of faith. To fill it out and ask God to bless you. So that you might be a blessing to others. And then see if he doesn't open the gates of heaven. Open his treasure houses and bless you. So that you might be a blessing. I've seen it over and over again. So this week pray for that. Where is God seeking to use me to be a blessing. And the more I think he uses you, the more he'll give you to use. And so, stay out in faith. Maybe put a pledge out there a little bigger than you're doing and saying, God, I'm going to increase it and I want you to increase for me so that I can give. And if that's your motive, just so that you can give more, I'm, I've seen God give you more to give more. So try that this year. Well, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you bless us in so many ways. And you call us to be a blessing to other people through all the blessings we have received. And you call us to collectively come together with our resources so that we can help those who are hurting. We can lift up those who need assistance. We can share so that no one goes without Lord, show us the fullness of that sharing this year. Show us how we can be a blessing to this community and beyond. Lord, use us to share your love throughout the world. And so, Lord, now as we come to present these, our tithes and offerings, multiply them so that we can do this. Show us where they're to be spent, Lord. We trust you in all these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our scripture lesson this morning <clears throat> comes from the book of Acts. The 19th chapter, beginning the first verse. Hear now these words. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into, then, into what then were you baptized? And they answered into John's baptism. And Paul said, John's baptized with the baptism of repentance. 
telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, on this second Sunday in January, many churches across the world are celebrating the baptism of Jesus and thus are talking about baptism. For some reason in Christianity, baptism has become a very divisive act. People get all upset with it. How are we doing it? When are we doing it? And why are we doing it? And the interesting thing when you talk to people is most of the arguments over baptism are mechanical in nature, not theological. And that's the problem with humanity. When we can't understand something spiritually, we bring it down to a human mechanical level and we look at it that way instead of seeing what God is doing. But baptism is important in our faith. It is the act of incorporating into a body of believers and that is why baptism is done corporately. It is that time when we get to stand up and profess our faith among others. To let people know that I believe in Jesus Christ. That's why it's not done privately. Baptism involves all the people. It is the beginning of our membership in the church and our new life. And of course, there's more to church membership though than simply being baptized. You know, it's not like, okay, I'm baptized and that's all I need to do. That's just the beginning. There's growth. And if we stop there, we might become like some people in this story. It was a smaller town and three churches wanted to hold a revival. So they pooled their resources together so they could do one revival. And after the revival, some members of the church got together, from each church got together to see how it went, whether this was a good thing. And the first church says, we did really well in the revival. We gained four new members. The second church said, we did even better. We gained six members from the revival. And then there was the third church that said, oh, we had a wonderful revival. Ten of our most worst members joined other churches. <laughs> See, sometimes people stop at baptism, and there's no growth. There's no letting the Holy Spirit work in their lives. And they become people that are still dealing with the sin, dealing with everything, and they become those members that no one wants to be around. And while water baptism is important, it's interesting to note something in Scripture. Neither Paul nor any of the apostles ever talk about their baptism. You ever notice that? They never mention their water baptism in Christ. But they all speak about their baptism of the Holy Spirit. And see, that's what I think is important to them, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is a baptism God does. The baptism... And this baptism by the Holy Spirit, it doesn't necessarily coincide with the water baptism. For some people, when you read the book of Acts, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and then they were baptized. Others were baptized and then filled with the Holy Spirit at that same time. And then others, it was later. But notice in our lesson today that we hear talk about receiving John's baptism. Now John's baptism was simply a baptism of repentance which is a necessary step to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the first step to our receiving the Holy Spirit is re recognizing our own sin and repenting. And repentance is an interesting word. It simply means to stop going one direction, turn around and go in the opposite direction. That's what the word literally means. And when we repent of our sin, it means we recognize that we were heading towards death and we turn around and head towards Christ in life. That's what repentance is. And we need that repentance in our life. And we really don't do John's baptism anymore. Because there isn't really any need to it. Because when John came out baptizing, 
this baptism of repentance, he had a specific purpose in mind, and he was pointing to one who would come. He was reminding the Jews that what the prophets had said before him, that the people were not pleasing God by their attempts of being obedient to the God. See, in his baptism, he points to Jesus, the Messiah, who would show the full extent of what it means to be a righteous person. And that would simply be to have faith in Jesus Christ. To have faith, not obedience to the law. Thus the purpose of John's baptism was that God the Father told John to baptize, to identify Jesus the Messiah. And so John's message was, behold, the Lamb of God. Now today we have just one baptism, one water baptism. And I think for the Jews and the Gentiles, those are non-believing, those who didn't grow up in a Jewish faith, this baptism looks a little different even though it's the same baptism. Because something I think a little different is happening in each one. See, the Jews understood baptism. I think the reason we argue <clears throat> about baptism so much is because in Scripture they didn't tell us how to do it. Ever notice that? They don't tell the mechanics of how to baptize. And the reason they don't is because the Jews baptized. We forget that sometimes. It was a natural part of their faith. They had all these ceremonial wash, washings that they did. And so for the Jews, when they hear about this one baptism, to them it is a reminder that you don't have to do all these ritual washings all the time anymore. That there is just one baptism. And it shows an end to this legalism you've been following. And so that the message that Peter and the other apostles conveyed to the Jews was to them that wash this one last time to mark the end of their life under the law is a way of providing closure to that former way of life. Now, if you were a non-Jew, this wouldn't make any sense to you. You didn't know anything about ceremonial washings and you didn't rely on these things. And so Paul, when he went out, he explained to the Gentiles that there is only one baptism that is done by the Holy Spirit to join people together into one holy body, the body of Christ. And for non-Jews, non this represents the beginning of a new life. That baptism marks that point in our life where the old is gone and a new life begins. Where we become new creations in Christ. The old is gone. And we are no longer defined by our past. Isn't that a good thing? That we are not defined by our past, but we are defined by a glorious future. And even when we stumble in the future, we're still defined by a new future. And so that's what baptism resent, represents, that new beginning in the life of Christ. But then there's this third baptism that's mentioned in Scripture. Third for <clears throat> lack of a better wording. <clears throat> and that is the baptism of fire of the Holy Spirit. Both Matthew and Luke record in John saying that John the Baptist saying, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And this is an image that the New Testament writers used. That it is fire that purifies. That it is fire that refines gold and silver. And that that Holy Spirit will come upon us. And will baptize in that spirit. And refine us. Purging out all that is bad. Burning up all that is bad. Now the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as I said, doesn't always coincide with baptism by water. Today, most times we'll find that the baptism by the Holy Spirit, that people become aware of it, they become filled with it, and they want to be baptized. There are still cases where people, when they baptize, they receive that Holy Spirit. And that's kind of a neat thing to see, but more and more people, God is working in their lives, and they're recognizing, I need to be baptized, because the Holy Spirit is working in them. But water baptism is important because it gives us that date. The date that we stood before others and confessed our faith. That date that we can remember. 
And that's something we need to do constantly is remember our baptism. Remember that God loves us. Remember that God has received us and incorporated into his life. And see, but we even just never forget about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I love what Corey Ten Boone said about the Holy Spirit and how it works in our lives. She gave us this image. She says, I have a glove here in my hand. The glove cannot do anything by itself. But when my hand is in it, it can do many things. True, it is not the glove, but my hand in the glove that acts. And she said, we are gloves. It is the Holy Spirit in us who is the hand, who does the job. We simply have to make room for the hand so that every finger is filled. And I love what J.B. Phillips said. He said, every time we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, we mean that we believe that there is a living God able and willing to enter human personality and change it. And I think that's exciting about the Holy Spirit. Not just enter humans, but to enter our situations. That there is a God who still interferes in our lives. Who doesn't leave us to our circumstances, our misery, our pain. There is still a Holy Spirit that comes and interferes. And I know a lot of people have been talking about the events of the last week. Social media became erupted about it. We begin to want to just rail about this or that. And what I found is we have to watch how we rail because if we only rail about this and not about that, then our words become hollow. See, it's easy to rail. It's easy to feel isolated. It's easy to feel like the whole world is against you and just shout against it. That's what social media is good about. We can get on there and just dump, complain, instead of lifting up. You ever look at <clears throat> excuse me, how many stories are lifting up and how many stories are pointing fingers? And then how many are just trying to sell you something? See, we have to realize that we are not alone. That we are called to be consistent in our word, in our message, in our love. And there's people out there who do not like us. There's people out there who don't want to hear our message of hope. Almost a century ago, there was an atheistic philosopher, Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche. And he issued this challenge. He said, show me that you are redeemed and I will believe in your redeemer. He was putting forth an argument that says, okay, show me that you were redeemed 2,000 years ago on the cross, and I will believe. Well, it's an event that you had to have been there to see, and everything else is in faith of hearing about it. But what non-believers fail to see is that all the signs we have still point to a Redeemer. They can't see every day there are signs pointing to a Redeemer, and it's through the Holy Spirit that gives us those signs. Too many of our approach to God is, unless God gives me everything I want, the way I want it, when I want it, I will not believe in that God. And that's not the way God works. God works by lifting us and changing our lives and calling us to go out and to be a witness. And the most effective witness of all is a life that clearly possesses a strength that can cope with the human situation with all its problems, all its tragedy, and all its pain. There is evil in the world. There are bad people in the world. And there are bad things that just happen to you. And you're going to run into people who just don't like you. When they come into church, they're really good to tell the pastor they don't like him. Even after you've been here for three years, I'll have people who come up and they'll hear something I say and they'll met, think that I said it intentionally against them. And those things kind of hurt because I don't intentionally go out to hurt anyone. 
But if we live that life where we feel so isolated that we think everybody's against us, then we'll live an isolated life. There'll be an emptiness in us. Instead of seeing that there's a spirit available to us, as William Barclay said, these were his words, that a power to cope with the human situation and all its problems and all its tragedy and all its pain. They said we can just simply sit back and rail against all the problems we face. Or we can live lives filled with the spirit and make a difference. It's easy con to condemn. It's harder to unite, to forgive. It's easy to separate and isolate. It's harder to bring together. And the deeper the void in our lives, the more it seems we want to rail against everything. And the more isolated we want to become. But when our souls are filled with God's love, we can make a difference every day and impact the world for good. I love this <clears throat> story I read about the turn of the century. It goes back to the 1950s, not too far after World War II. And Howard Mummum, he was a Methodist pastor, and he had the opportunity to go serve as minister to the American church in Paris. And after he was one Sunday services, he started noticing there was a person there that people were gathered around and just delighted to see. And he finally realized this man was Albert Kamen, the author who had been coming to the church, first to hear Marcel Dupré play the organ but later to hear Mummon's sermons. And Mummon became a friend with the existentialist chemist, who by then was famous for his novels, The Plague and The Stranger, and for essays such as The Myth of Sis Sisyphus. And the two men met regularly to discuss questions of religious belief that Camus had arrived, had raised. And he kept these discussions quiet for nearly 40 years, 50 years, until he finally in an interview, when he was 92, he began to share some of these conversations. And in one conversation, Camus told Mammon this. He said, the reason I have been coming to church is because I am seeking. I'm almost on a pilgrimage, seeking something to fill the void that I am experiencing, and no one else knows. Certainly the public and the readers of my novels, while they see the void, are not finding the answers in what they are reading. But deep down, you are right. I am searching for something in the world that the world is not giving me. And he goes on to say, in a sense, we are all products of a mundane world, a world without spirit. The world in which we live and the lives which we live are decidedly empty. Since I have been coming to church, I have been thinking a great deal about the idea of a transcendent, something that is other than this world. It is something that you do not hear much about today, but I am finding it. He says, one of the basic teachings that I've learned from Sar Sartre is that man is alone. We are solitary centers of the universe. Perhaps we ourselves are the only ones who have ever asked the great questions of life. Perhaps since Nazism, we are the ones who have loved and lost and who are therefore fearful of life. That is what led us to the sense that there is a great idea of powerful influence, but there is something that can bring meaning to my life. I certainly don't have it, but it is there. On Sunday mornings, I hear that the answer is God. You have made it very clear to me, Howard that we are not the only ones in the world. There is something that is invisible. We may not hear the voice, but there is some way in which we can become aware that we are not the only ones in the world and that there is help for all of us. I know that was a little long, but those are powerful words from one who was searching, one who seemed to have a life that was worth everyone coming up and being around him who seemed to have it all, but was said there was a void in his life. Too many of us are walking around with that void in their life because we're not allowing it to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Too many of us are acting like we've only received John's baptism. We stop there at repentance. And we're not growing in faith, not growing in the Spirit. 
They don't see a future. As I said, God is a God of the future. The Spirit helps us to live lives that are not defined by our past or the circumstances of the day. They're recognizing that we can get through anything. And to know if you are living by the questions, then you can reflect on these few questions. Am I growing in love? One of the key markers of the Holy Spirit work in life is the way that we love one another. This is one of the last things that Jesus told his disciples before going to the cross. And secondly, am I becoming more like Jesus? Another key aspect of walking in the Spirit is that our life will begin to look more and more like Jesus. You will begin to step away from things like bitterness, jealousy, greed, lust, and anger. And you'll step more towards things like love, kindness, generosity, justice, and purity. And that's because Jesus revolutionizes everything about your life. And lastly, am I living with purpose? We all want to live with purpose. In fact, it is desire of, that God has put within you. To, he has given you a purpose. To live by the Spirit is to be baptized by the Spirit. It is knowing God is working in you to live the life He has called you to live. It is easy to get caught up in the problems of this world instead of looking at, am I making a difference in the world? God calls you to be a witness in a dark world by living by the Spirit. By being baptized by the Spirit and letting that light shine. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you fill us with the Holy Spirit. That it's always there <coughs> to guide us, to lead us, to show us your love. Lord, help us to not shun the Spirit, but to live by it. Lord, help us to learn to hear the words of the Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that when we go to pray to you and have no words, that your Spirit comes and translates our inner groanings, our inner pains into words that you hear. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. It's in your Son's most precious holy name we pray. Amen. Your grace. And as we leave, let us reach up and grab God's hand and know that he holds you, that he loves you, that he sent his Holy Spirit to fill you so that you might live the best possible life. Go and live.
for Christ. Go and be his witness. Go and share that love with the world. Amen.